Well, it's just about one o'clock, so I think we can jump right in. Um, close that real quick. Okay, so welcome to the second lightning talk session. My name is Peggy Greisinger, um, and I'll, I will be the, the facilitator for this session. So um, this session is being live streamed uh, to the LD4 YouTube channel and recorded, and it will be saved on YouTube for future viewing. Um, this slide, which I know is probably really small, um, is um, it has some useful resources, including code of conduct, um, information about how to join Slack and the collaborative project um, for the conference and um, links to, or the names of the tech support channel and the Twitter hashtag. Um, we're gonna have a joint Q&A at the end of all three presentations, um, but please feel free to make sure make use of the Q&A function in Zoom to start adding questions. Um, and um, uh, we'll make sure to get to those. You can also just put them in the chat uh, as you have them and stuff like that, but we'll, we'll get to them at the, at the last 15 minutes of the session. Um, so we, right, we can get started right away. Our first talk is authoritative data, user stories and change management from Lynette Rail. Lynette is senior, senior developer at Cornell University leading efforts to improve access to authoritative data as linked data for the LD4P grant. Yes, uh, so as mentioned, I work at Cornell University and I facilitate the best practices for authoritative data working group. I'm going to talk about the outputs of the first charter and the current status of the second charter. So first we'll take a look at the first charter. Uh, a core principle of really both working groups is to include members from different parts of the authoritative data pipeline. So we have authoritative data providers to improve our understanding of how the data, their data is being used. And we include consumers who represent the cataloging community and others who use authoritative data. We also include developers who create the software that access authoritative data APIs and create applications and tools that make that data available to consumers as part of their workflow. And the second uh, charter brings in a few new voices. So the first charter focused on creating a common understanding of the needs by defining user stories from the perspective of each of these roles. So we have 32 cataloger user stories, 44 application developer user stories, both from the UI perspective and the backend perspective. And we have 38 provider user stories. Once the user stories were defined, we engaged the broader community in helping us to prioritize the cataloger user stories. So we reached out to the PCC community with a survey that allowed users to move the stories around in buckets to rank them according to the importance for their work. From those, we created four prioritization categories based on the ranked level of importance. So the labels on the graph are highly abbreviated compared to the actual user stories, and they're pretty small, so I don't know if you can read them there. But at the end of the presentation, there is a link to the full analysis of the survey if you want to get the details of the user stories. So to give you a sense of the user stories, these are the top five in the priority group, in the priority graph. So um, the first is including extended context, and that is additional information about each search result that help the user to make a more accurate selection. The second is filtering search results by class. For example, when searching for names, you might wanna limit the names to just person names, filtering out organizations and other types of names. And when searching for an exact match, the user wants to know if that exact match doesn't exist. And when editing a resource like a work where you want to connect to authoritative data like a subject, the search needs to include the URI for each result. This allows the result, the resource to link directly to the exact result that was selected. And the last one is that for authorities that are hierarchical in nature, uh, users want to see broader and narrower terms included in the search results. 
So with that full set of user stories defined and the results of the survey, we created a document that organizes the user stories. Uh, the, primary, the primary focus is from the cataloger user story perspective and the developer and provider user stories are listed underneath each cataloger user story that they support. Related user stories are gathered together. So for example, user stories related to searching are together. Uh, that is like search for exact match, left anchor search, keyword search, those are all together in the document. Uh, as another example, users relate, uh, user stories related to refining results through filtering, they're all together, and user stories related to making an accurate selection, like additional context and relevance rating, those are all together. So the last piece of information that we include for each is the priority level itself that was identified in the survey. So this is what the document looks like. This is a very small section of the document. Uh, it provides um, the, you can see that within the main section called user stories related to performance, there is a subsection uh, that is search results return quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Since it rated as level one in the survey, it's marked as having priority level one. There's a fuller definition of what we mean by search results return quickly. And then you see the list of the user stories. The cataloger user stories are listed, followed by the supporting developer and provider user stories. So then we see the start of the next subsection, which is time out gracefully. And it's going to have the same information. It's going to have the priority, the definition, and the user stories. And this is the basic format for the whole document. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the second charter. Uh, in this particular charter, we're looking at how you can express change management in documents that the authority, authority data providers can create and downstream users can process to update their cache data. So we identified two primary use cases. The first is maintenance of a cache that includes a full download of all the source data. The desire here is to receive all data changes so the cache can be modified to match the source. Um, using change documents means the cache should not have to go through that full download process again. It processes changes incrementally, which saves processing time and will allow for more timely, smaller updates, keeping the, class, the cache closer to real-time synchronization with the source data. There are other factors that can impact this, but it represents a significant improvement over regularly processing a full download. So the other use case that was identified is caching a subset of data in an application. So most commonly, this is like the caching of a label, which is used to avoid um, having to retrieve data from the source just to show a label as users are browsing through your application. So in this case, consumers are really only interested in the data that they have chosen to cache and want to quickly locate that data in the change management feed. So with the use cases defined, we focused on the types of change that can occur. And we identified seven types of change. And the next step was to identify what kind of information do we need for each type of change. So first, for comparison, I'm showing here what kinds of information you would use if we were working with just like a database record. And the key takeaway from this is really that it's a fairly limited amount of information that you need, and it's really a straightforward process. Now, when you look at each type of change from the perspective of representing them in a linked data system, for new, we need the graph of the new entity, but there are also some challenges to defining what, what do we mean by graph? Um, how do we identify the edges of the graph? Do we need to do anything special to handle blank nodes? And what about if in the graph, there's a reference to another entity? And that sort of ties back to those where the edges of the graph, do we include information about that additional entity? <clears throat> so delete, 
which is usually very straightforward because you usually just get an ID or in this case, a URI of the thing you want to delete. But for linked data, we again have to worry about the edges of the graph. Are we just deleting the triples that have that URI as the subject? What about if that URI is in an object for another entity? Um, and similarly, we need to handle blank notes gracefully and we need to deal with references to other entities. Um, and then there's an implementation specific challenge for delete. Uh, some downstream consumers may store, instead of having like a triple store, they may store the entities as a blob. And you can easily just remove the blob, but what if there are entities referenced in, um, in other entities? The deleted entities, sorry, the deleted entity is referenced in other entities. How will those triples be removed? Um, so I don't think the change management documents themselves are going to solve that challenge, but it is one just to be aware of. But that said, it's highly recommended that you deprecate instead of delete. Um, that allows for maintaining that URI. URIs are generally considered to be permanent. And um, so instead of deleting it, you provide information about the deprecation. So primarily, it's a matter of adding triples that identify that the entity is now deprecated. And if there's a replacement for it, uh, what URI to use instead. Uh, sometimes there may be some other changes. Uh, some triples may be removed that are no longer applicable. Or in some cases, the deprecation itself is identified by a class. Uh, so the example here I give is it goes from MADS RDF authority to MADS RDF deprecated authority. And so that's a, a delete of one and an assertion of the other. So updates have the same issues with blank nodes and references to other entities. It has an additional challenge of needing to distinguish between just a single changed value versus uh, additional and adding of an additional value for the same predicate since multiple values may be valid. Um, if a changed, it's a changed value, then what does it really mean to update a triple? So for most of our discussions, we've been leaning towards what this really means is you identify the triple that's going to be deleted, and then you identify the new triple that's going to be added as the replacement. There's also a special case for update, and that is label changes. So our second use case very clearly identified label change as being really important. And so there's a desire to be able to look through the list, the feed of change documents and quickly identify which ones are simply label changes. So we're still working on what that means and how we would identify that and what other challenges might be involved. Um, but that is definitely a special case of the updates. So merging is really just basically a new with two deletes. So the only challenge um, we identified is that some authorities will reuse one of the URIs um, for the new merged. You are the new merged entity. And this sort of prevents the pattern of deprecating the entity that is no longer being used in the same way as before. And split is very similar. Uh, for split, we're going to create the new entities that are split away, and we're going to deprecate the original entity that was split. But again, some in some authorities, split can add the new challenge of the URI of the original entity being used for one of the two or more new entities that were split off. So where are we going next? Uh, we'll be continuing to discuss the types of change and the information required to express these changes and what challenges can we anticipate that need to be addressed. Uh, we'll be continuing to have general discussions around what does change management mean in linked data in general. But on the practical side, we are moving forward towards making the actual recommendations. Uh, we've explored delivery approaches, and at the moment, we are leaning towards activity streams uh, because uh, the Library of Congress is in the process of developing activity streams, and Getty already has them in use. 
Um, we're also going to be looking at what format we actually want to express the changes in. So I've included links here to the charter and output of the first uh, charter and also to the current set of working documents that we have in the second charter. So I do have just a minute left, so I'm going to see if I can't jump over. Oops. Hang on one second. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost the pages that I had, so I may not be able to do that. Ah, this will probably do it. Um, I gotta get out of full screen. All right, so now I have a little less time because it took me a second to get that done. Uh, but I wanted to show you sort of the structure of what we're, we have are in the process of beginning to discuss. This is very preliminary, um, but this is what activity streams look like. And if we were doing an ad of a single triple, we basically identify its type as create and add the triple. If we wanted to do several, we just add several. Um, and for deletes, it would be similar. We mark it as a type delete and you identify delete. Uh, you'll see that uh, blank nodes are in here as well. Um, and so basically, you'll, if we went through this whole document, you would see it is a whole series of just deletes and creates. And then, of course, they need to be processed in order because if you're doing something like a split, you need to create the new entity so that when you deprecate, you have something to reference to. And the other that we are looking at is... Um, Instead of expressing them as a graph of triples, we could express them as Sparkle queries because then you can do all the actions required in one query. Um, there are challenges for both of those approaches. And since I am really out of time, I'm not gonna go into those challenges, but I would be happy to answer more questions in Slack or during the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynette. That was wonderful. Um, We'll move, and as, as we said, um, there'll be a Q&A at the end. So please, if you have any questions for Lynette, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, so our second talk is semantic citations as a service, developing a proof of concept for adding semantic markup to researcher websites from Sarah Kasten, um, who is from the Hesburgh Libraries at the University of Notre Dame. Sarah is a research and development analyst whose work focuses on business analysis to support innovation in libraries. And she's also the co-facilitator of the LD4 Wikidata Affinity Group. So go ahead, Sarah. Let me unmute myself. All right, thank you, Peggy, uh, Michelle, and to all the organizers of this year's conference. And hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Kasten. I work at the University of Notre Dame in a new team in my library that is focused on defining opportunities for creating new library services. What I'm gonna to present today is a work in progress summary of a new service idea that involves linked data. As this work has happened concurrently with my team's development of a new structured approach to service design and implementation, I intend to present the working idea itself, what we've been calling semantic citations as a service, as well as provide something of a meta-analysis of what an innovation process or skill set can look like. Before discussing this particular idea in greater detail, I'm going to take a few moments to outline our approach to creating and managing an innovation or research and development process. A few years ago, library managers in my organization spent a day in a workshop where a foresight creative problem-solving assessment was administered. This is a proprietary skills or aptitude test to help define your personal preferences to different stages of problem solving, which they define as clarifying, ideating, developing, and implementing. You take a test, and like any number of personality tests, it returns results with explanations on your particular perceived strengths. The idea is that some people may have strengths in one particular area or some combination of the four and that is helpful looking at the composition of your team to cultivate a balance of preferences. Also implied is that problem solving can have a predictable structure. 
While lived experience of solving a problem may not reflect a complete demarcation of stages or may not be wholly linear, for the purposes of planning and pursuing a solution to your problem, you can expect certain activities. Fast forward a couple of years and my team was tasked to create a structured repeatable process for designing new services or making big changes to existing ones. We revisited this assessment and its methodology and gravitated towards co-opting this terminology to provide a high level shorthand for both the strengths of individual team members, as well as the clusters of activities that we've defined for each stage. The slide here outlines the key objectives of each phase and with our team's administrative approach to our group meeting calendar, documentation requirements and processes, and a preset assessment criteria for evaluating our projects, comprises an outline of our approach to library service innovation. The desired outcome for any project is to have a developed business case to support administrator's decision-making on whether to pursue a new service opportunity. The clarification stage is the starting point for our process. This is a phase of learning, of listening and synthesizing information, of understanding context so that you can address meaningful issues for your organization and for your users. Understanding your organization's values, strategic priorities, and longer term goals is the best starting point I found to keeping these inquiries relevant and productive. The slide here outlines the questions I keep in the front of my mind as I conduct my research as well as some methods of inquiry. So this project is the outcome of three separate threads of clarifying work on my part. The first was an effort to understand how academic researchers represent themselves and their work online. I began to conduct an environmental scan and synthesize trends here, looking at what their websites look like, how and whether they rise to the top of Google search results, whether persistent identifiers like ORCIDs are adopted, whether they use social media to promote their works, and so on. What I discovered was that routinely, the top search results for academic researchers included their profile on their home institution's webpage, their Wikipedia page if one existed, their Google Scholar profile if claimed, and either a personal website or a website for their lab group. Things are slightly more complicated where someone has a particularly common name or shares a name with any other person with substantial representation online. There would often be an unclaimed stub Google knowledge panel that provides very basic information and it, that's sometimes incorrect about the researcher. Within the websites that they control, their institutional, personal, or lab web page, there tends to be some biographical information, description of research interests, and a static list of public, public, published works. As I reviewed, I kept track of issues that seemed like problems. Institutional and personal web pages are frequently out of date, particularly for their publication list, possibly speaking to a barrier for researchers and academic departments in managing their online spaces. I saw a very inconsistent adoption of persistent identifiers like ORCIDs. It also seems like a missed opportunity that researcher web pages, which ranks so high in, its, in search results, did not include any semantic markup that could further help search engines construct relationships between these people and their works across the web. And then finally, I need to ask, what role do libraries have in this problem space? To provide a couple of examples of things I was seeing, Chad Zerbel is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Minnesota. Top research results for his name return his personal site, institutional web pages, his Twitter, his and another Chad Zerbel's LinkedIn. Looking at the stub Google knowledge panel, it seems that Google knows there is a researcher called Chad Zerbel, but is still trying to figure out who he is despite his active web presence and top search results. The middle screenshot shows an image of some guys at a bar that was drawn from another Chad Zerbel's Twitter account. A week later, I performed the search again and found that the image had changed. We now see the headshot of a high school basketball player. Neither image is researcher Chad. So Google is still trying to figure it out, um, but maybe needs some help from structured data. Elizabeth Archie is a professor in, of biology at the University of Notre Dame. She has a relatively detailed profile on her official university webpage. Notably though, an article that she just published that received some media attention is not yet listed on her page. 
She is the principal investigator for the Archie Lab. Their website includes a lot of duplicate information as her, from her individual webpage, but orients a description of research projects and outputs around the lab as a group, rather than Professor Archie as an individual. Another thread was to better understand my library's needs to gather and organize the research output of our institution's researchers in order to form collection strategy and negotiations with vendors, especially for our very expensive e-journal packages. You're experiencing problems that there are no comprehensive sources of citation data for institutions affiliates. We are cobbling together data from multiple sources, some behind paywalls. And while there are a variety of efforts in process in process in this domain, it's unclear what cost-effective and sustainable solutions may emerge. My outstanding questions include whether it's possible to incentivize re researchers themselves to contribute their publication data in order to cover gaps in our data sources, and what does that partnership look like from the library's perspective? Furthermore, what value does it provide to other campus stakeholders if the library is curating this information? The third thread of clarification work has been my continued exposure to Wikidata and the community of librarians working with it. Wikidata intrigues me for several reasons. As a store of identifiers for a given represented item, as a source of data feeding into the Google Knowledge Graph, as reusable data that can be enhanced over time. Through the Wikisite initiative, there's been a lot of activity activity of interest for academic institutions, including bulk loads of citation data and researcher profiles, and tools like Scolia and the Author Disambiguator tool to help Wikidata editors work with scholarly communication data. Librarians have been active participants in this space with examples set by IUPUI, Stanford, Vanderbilt, and others to create items for their institutional researchers in Wikidata. For my own institution, a high percentage of researchers already have some representation in Wikidata, and as much as 70% of research, recent publication output, specifically for STEM, STEM disciplines, has already been loaded into Wikidata. The potential and power of Wikidata sits very much in the willingness of people to add, add data there. Many librarians from diverse institutions have been editing Wikidata already, but I see outstanding questions about how to sustain this work as well as how to enumerate the benefits of contributing to Wikidata back to our home institutions. Once you feel you understand your problem spaces, we move forward into ideation. Ideation is a time to stretch your imagination, to think big and be creative to come up with solutions to your organizations or your users' problems. You have learned a lot during the clarification process, but you don't wanna to be too weighed down by details at this time. I especially enjoy looking for ideas that can help address multiple possible problems or opportunities. And for those who are wondering, these are ideas not born of mythological hallway or water cooler chats. People are informed beforehand, have time to prepare, and then intentionally gather to collaborate. So during the ideation process, these interrelated clarification threads coalesced into an idea for a service represented here. Semantic, uh, semantic citations as a service suggest that our library would aggregate data about our researchers and outputs and then load it into Wikidata. We would develop a process for querying and exporting data and transforming it to meet multiple needs. First, create JSONLD schema.org tags to add structured data to researcher web pages, as well as generate up-to-date publication lists for them. We envision that this could be a full circle service where researchers have a mechanism to share data back to us in order to supplement publication data missing from other sources of information. We could also generate reports to support library collection strategy and acknowledge that there, would there are probably other interesting things we could do with this data set. We hypothesize that we would want to maintain a local data store to ensure data integrity, but we're especially excited that we could be that we could be contributing to Wikidata to make our data set publicly available and reusable. Once you have an idea, 
you need to move back into a slightly more skeptical and detail-oriented mode. My team has a formal assessment at this time and decides whether the idea is worth, worth pursuing based on our understanding of the library's strategic priorities. If we proceed into the developing stage, you need to start hammering out the details of your idea, evaluating for feasibility, identifying its risks, strengths, and weaknesses. This project is currently in this stage. We are in greater detail testing and evaluating sources of data about our researchers and their output, organizing data models for Wikidata that could meet multifaceted needs, designing workflows for adding to and exporting from Wikidata, transforming samples of Wikidata into desired markup, and figuring out a technical infrastructure for storing and moving data. Generally, thinking about what it would take to launch and maintain this kind of service. When ready, we have a formal assessment to review the progress of the developing work and evaluate further for desirability and feasibility of the idea. If approved, we move into an implementing mode. This is the time to start taking more concrete action to pursue an idea, armed with details and documentation to help make your case. A solid business case will document the reasoning behind the project, understand costs and benefits, risks and gains, and will consider startup as well as long-term needs. We would likely develop minimalistic prototypes to demonstrate the idea. We would be seeking sponsorship from leaders, partnership from other interested parties. And this is kind of a, a point where you need to move into a teaching and advocacy role here. And you should also expect to um, iterate further on your idea as others become involved. So I have some questions for you, the audience, um, that maybe we can take over to Slack and I would love to hear, see, hear some responses to. Does your organization have a consistent process for identifying problems to address or opportunities to pursue? Do your organizations or your library users have problems that can be addressed using Wikidata? If you have an idea for a new library service or have a change to recommend, how do you develop and test that idea? And how do you make a case for it with your administration? And finally, what challenges do you personally face when working in an experimental mode? I have just one slide left. Some takeaways kind of from my perspective working in this manner. I think it's very important to maintain skepticism. Objectivity is difficult to maintain when you're excited by an idea but relying on process to install checks and balances as you work is really helpful. You should always be documenting risks. Self-awareness is required. What are your preferences, strengths, and weaknesses? And how do your colleagues help balance you out? Keeping track of what you don't know can be a helpful wayfinding mechanism through your process. Cultivating a diverse skill set for yourself and within your teams can be wonderful for having a enormous breadth of knowledge to draw from. And then finally, I think even when you're targeting, when your target audience is your institutional or local community, look for opportunities to create public goods. So thank you for listening. I, I hope this has been some food for thought. Um, I would love to see some answers to your questions and um, look forward to receiving any from you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, please hold those questions or keep those questions in mind for the Q&A session at the end for sure. Okay, so our final talk is Beyond Topic Classification, Logical Links at the Claim Level, presented by Jamie Joyce and Mark Antoine Perrault. <laughs> uh, Jamie Joyce is, or Jamie is the Executive Director of the Society Library, a non-traditional digital library that organizes the arguments, claims, and evidence extracted from various forms of media, including books, scholarly papers, news media, social media, and more. She has an interest in simulating societal scale dialectics and creating more advanced models for political decision making and production of legislation. Mark Antoine is a member of the Society Libraries team and has studied neurobiology, mathematics, and systems science, worked in natural knowledge processing and knowledge representation, and has spent the last decade designing collective intelligence tools, notably Idealoom. He is also now working on HyperKnowledge, a knowledge representation model that uses explicit meta discourse to compare viewpoints. So Jamie and Mark Antoine, take it away. All right, thank you so much. Okay, hopefully you all can see my screen. Please holler at me if you don't. 
Um, great. Uh, so we're only here with you for a brief time today, but we're really excited. Uh, my name is Jamie Joyce, and I'm here with Mohand Juan Paran. And today we're going to be talking about what we believe to be novel ideas and interpretations regarding libraries and linked data. Specifically, we're going to be discussing logical links at the claim level, which ultimately refers to the work of the Society Library, which is a fledgling nonprofit organization. Um, before we get started, though, I just really want to thank you all so much for your time. The Society Library is a very non-traditional library, but everyone at LD4 has been extremely inclusive and welcoming, and it's really an honor to talk among experts like yourselves and be included in the conversation, so thank you. Um, so what is the Society Library, and what makes it a non-traditional library. Um, the Society Library is undertaking uh, is an undertaking that is looking to address some of the challenges of the post-information age. There's such an incredible volume of content that's produced every single day across various platforms and in multiple forms of media, so it can be really overwhelming to make sense of. Um, to address this, the Society Library is not working to be a library of all of those documents and artifacts filled with ideas and organized by topic per se, but instead be a library of ideas themselves, organized as a dialogue map or a dialectic, which means we're doing a lot of deduplicating and combining and steel manning along the way. And this is our interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights dedication towards providing for public enlightenment. Um, said another way, as it was mentioned in the introduction, um, you know, we're extracting arguments, claims, and evidence from various forms of media to essentially construct knowledge graphs, which articulate the logical reasoning from various points of view on complex social and political issues. And all of this content is meant to be made available as a public educational collection and tool. Um, and although we've performed a variety of different projects in the introduction was mentioned, we work on like decision making models and we've done some legislative projects. Um, in terms of our library collections, we've been working on three, and that includes the subject of climate change, election integrity, and then COVID-19. And you'll notice that um, we've mentioned that there are subtopics to these topics and then also questions that are related to those topics. Um, questions for us actually shape our ontology. It shapes the course of our dialectic modeling and our subtopics relate to a distinct number of debates within the larger topic debate. Climate change, for example, has over 270 unique subtopics. COVID-19 has over 500. And in general, our data is composed of a series of questions. And these questions are followed by positions, which are also expressed as claims, but they um, are, are uh, you being used to address and answer those questions. And then those positions are subsequently related to the categories and subcategories of arguments, claims, and evidence, which we've derived from references, which either support or refute each respective position. And I do wanna stress that uh, this must be a very flexible structure. And luckily our software is quite flexible to accommodate for changes in the organization of data as we collect more information over time. And as that same uh, ontology must accommodate to change. Uh, or must change to accommodate that. Um, and so in case you're interested, this is all curation-based work and it begins with acquiring mass amounts of data. We acquire a lot of data from the internet archive, various data lakes, and through our own collection processes. Um, the GDELT project, for example, monitors news in over hundred countries and instantly translates it every second of every day. So we've tapped into their network. Um, the next step in our process is that we transform all of that content, even if it's video or audio into text, we still preserve the images and audio files, but in order to extract the argumentation and claims, we transform it into text like this. And then we extract those claims and arguments and put it into a more standardized logical form. We have our analysts organize these claims into syllogisms, and it's actually through a process which we call descriptive emergent structuring of that data that we arrive at the questions. So as opposed to prescript prescriptively determining the questions that model the collection, Instead, we organize content, um, uh, uh, we, we collect a bunch of content and derive those questions from looking at those claims. So while we organize content from question to references in our database, we actually start by gathering references and then sussing out society's questions, which interestingly in turn shapes how we structure the data. Um, after much analysis and research and curation, uh, we put we input all of this content into a knowledge graph database. And so here are some screenshots, it's an example of the relationships. You'll see some questions related to COVID-19, various positions which answer that question. And then we start decomposing the positions which imply so many different claims within them into the various categories. Um, as we move forward, uh, those categories contain those arguments and claims. And our knowledge graph essentially maps 
what different types of claims are ontologically, such as whether they are positions or categories, premises as a part of an argument or claims unto themselves, um, as well as their logical links to each other. So whether um, it's pro con truth relevance in relation to each other. So like, for example, does the claim support the veracity of another claim or refute the relevance of another claim in the conversation? Um, or is that claim actually a premise in an argument package, for example? Our software also allows us to create packets of information in which we collapse a lot of information into one claim ID. This is a part of that deduplicating process. We call this concept web-based conceptual portmento, since we're just taking a bunch of media assets and combining it into one structure. And this is something that is expressed in what we call nodes. Um, so for example, one node, which can be, uh, so example, one node in which a claim can be expressed as just like multiple uh, other ways of phrasing it. So there can be multiple linguistic registers, multiple phrasings of a singular claim packaged into one node. Um, there can also be various references from which that claim can be found also packaged in that same structure, as well as media clips and audio clips in which that claim can be found, as well as many more other as well as many other uh, embeddable assets such as definitions equations quotes and more. Um, and so. Uh, <laughs> oh, I lost my notes for a second there Mark Antoine is going to take it away. Okay, uh, so what do all these maps have to do with libraries as you understand them. So hopefully a lot. Traditionally, library science classifies documents with taxonomy of themes, so people can start from a document and find related documents to the same thematic neighborhood. Now, imagine if librarians were to identify not only themes, but actual claims and documents. And more important, the epistemic status of the claim in the document, that is, is the document asking a question, providing evidence or alternatives or criticizing that claim. Then we could both situate the document in our dialogue maps we're building, allowing those maps to become new entry points for library research, and access the claim neighborhoods of a document, looking for other documents that support or question a given claim. So how to make this happen? So Society Library is already identifying claims and documents, and we intend to expose this as linked data. But this is a small bootstrap. From the library side, we thought you might be interested in expanding the existing work on citations tracking. When works cite one another, they often refer to claims in the quote. So identifying those claims that are epistemic status in both quoted and quoting documents might be actually realistic, whether done by humans, machines, or some combinations. Uh, so that would feed those maps. And eventually we can dream of a future where scholarly works would embed an internal dialogue map of its own claims, which could then be merged into a curated synthesis. And certainly both society and traditional libraries would both gain from improved dialogue map literacy from authors and users. Uh, now, we can do this with claims in the form of natural language statements, since it's what we've been doing, but we would gain much precision if, we, if there were an ontology for the claims themselves that would provide some notion of claim neighborhood. Now, what would that look like? I mean, obviously, we could classify claims based on their underlying theme, but that would be quite coarse. We could go a bit further, create a claim signature based on entity identification in the claim. Now, entities are discrete as identified, but there are many schemes to uh, create neighborhood entity neighborhood using statistical methodologies, ontologies, classification schemes like IEML, but to go further, to really have a good notion of claim neighborhood, we need to look at the structure of the claim itself. And now if you look at claims, and we've looked at claims, and we found that they fall into three broad categories. There's a lot of ontological claims. You know, uh, this entity falls in that categories. You know, Socrates is a man, the classic. Uh, there's a lot of situation claims. This happened, or should happen, or could happen. Uh, and those, the logical claims, we have ontologies for this. That's not a big deal. It's tractable. Situation claims are tractable through um, frames. There's, there's been this whole uh, study, uh, Berkeley frame net, verb net. There's a lot of ways to classify action schemas. So that's already tracked. You know, uh, it's been done. It can be done further. And the third category is meta claims, and this is what Society Library is working on: uh, argumentative claims, claim specialization, like the category 
uh, links. And other, there's a few other ones, causation, epistemic links, so on. But we're building that taxonomy. There's a few other taxonomies that already exist, are not in broad use, AIF, Scalanto, notably. Uh, so why are we building our, our own? There's a few reasons. But one, uh, for example, uh, we, we are saying the argument, the link between two claims is itself a claim. It's necessary to distinguish contesting an argument's premise from its validity and soundness. Uh, from a semantic web state uh, standpoint, it means that the claim is not a, the, the argument is not a triple, it's reified. Uh, and I, we're actually looking into going deeper into claim structure using RDF star, JSON LD star. Uh, but at this point, with what just classic reification, this is an example, this is not something live, but uh, this is what uh, we could do JSON uh, for, to express society's library current work, distinguishing relevance and uh, arguments themselves. Whole research program, uh, claim classification is a major AI goal, but it's an AI goal with a lot of immediately useful intermediate steps that would be useful for library science, for library patrons doing library research. And we'd love to talk uh, with you about how to collaborate so you could both use and enrich the claim maps we're building for your libraries. Jamie? <laughs> You're mute. All right, there we go. Hopefully I'm unmuted now. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you, Marc Antoine. And um, I'd like to say that while the Society Library is a distinct kind of library project, we're really hoping to benefit from the expertise and wisdom and craft from traditional librarianship by attracting librarians to join our board and help guide us on our very long-term mission. So in general, we're really interested in the question of what the future of knowledge representation and ontological structure could look like if we're desiring to create libraries that optimize for enlightenment, comprehension, and understanding. And and this is all our current thinking. So if anyone here is interested in our work, we really hope that you will reach out to us and consider joining our board or advisory board, or even just recommending libraries, librarians to us. And um, please know that we welcome any and all feedback in the hopes that it will continuously improve our thinking in this space. So I just wanna thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, now we'll have time for Q and A with all of them. Um, so we can just jump right in. Let me see. The first one we got, I can preach sure this is for Sarah. Um, have you thought about describing the quality of a source? Um, let's see. And, and if you ask these questions, feel free to unmute and add more context too. Um, I don't know, Sarah, if you saw that one. Uh, I'm looking at it. I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, let's see. Well, Magnus, if you want to type in the chat um, and explain a little bit more of what you were thinking there, um, that would be great. But we can also, there's another one for Sarah from Julian. Um, are you distinguishing between university researchers and faculty members? Does your project include both no, we have struggled with these types of distinctions at NYU. Um, not specifically, I think that we would want to include kind of both uh, where our university's researchers maybe don't have the traditional like teaching and, and responsibilities as well. I think we would still want to include them. It's maybe slightly more of a gray area where we have lecturers who don't have um, an active um, publishing profile or something like that. Um, but I think we would basically be looking at it being as inclusive as possible to what is um, represented on the university's websites. Thank you. Okay, here's one for Lynette regarding plenary community panel today. Um, where we said some missing voices are vendors and users. You have had success in getting those voices involved. Any tips to others on how to involve those voices? Yes, so in our particular case, we were already working with particular authorities and we sort of, I, I identified them specifically and reached out to them personally. And I find that 
actually making that personal request for involvement is the best way to get folks involved. Uh, I, I have to say that I put out a general call for the cataloger level and got a lot of response there. I think that's because they want to use this stuff and so they're very motivated to participate. Um, but definitely on the authoritative provider side and on the developer side, I reached out to a number of people individually. And that was the group that was harder to get involved because they're very busy and they have a lot of priorities of their own that they're working on. Um, so that would be my, my main suggestion is to personally reach out and maybe more than once. Sometimes they are kind of hesitant at first, but if you explain what your goals are and what you're trying to accomplish, uh, I think that helps to get people involved and see the vision of what you're trying to do. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate too, um, if, you, if you would like to just ask a question via your mic, just raise your hand to Michelle will um, allow you to unmute. So feel free to do that. Um, another question for Sarah, do you give your researchers or faculty the opportunity to give input as to whether they want information about them shared broadly? Yeah, this is a really important question. Um, I think where the university has already made kind of a decision for researchers that their um, status as an affiliate of the University of Notre Dame through kind of this required web presence. I'm a little like less um, concerned that there's any information about these people online because it kind of already exists. Um, but I think that what we're kind of thinking through in terms of the process of onboarding someone into the service would be to um, verify information that um, we would be kind of publishing to Wikidata or some kind of um, process to work with them to make sure we're not sharing anything that's like sensitive or um, uncomfortable for them. But I think that because the university has already kind of determined that they have a web presence, I'm, I'm not so worried about um, working in this space at all, if that makes sense. Thank you. Here's one for the Society Library folks. Um, has, this, has the Society Library project presented to other library conferences or groups and what kind of feedback have you received? Thank you for your question. Um, we have presented before at an ALA event, um, but it was digital and we didn't have the opportunity. We essentially created a video that was played and we didn't have the opportunity to get a lot of feedback. Um, we've certainly heard from librarians on Twitter and it's kind of like a, a mixed bag. Um, some people um, are concerned about like false equivalence and elevating certain platforms um, over others. And we're very careful about that on our website. We have a whole list of policies about uh, going down into the details of like even what language we use when we're representing claims. Um, so we have various policies and virtues and values which guide our work. Um, some librarians seem to be very like pro like this odd interpretation of the library mission and some uh, seem to be hesitant about it, but we'll take your feedback. <laughs> so please feel free to message us or just email me. I'm Jamie at societylibrary.com. Just a, a bit more. Um, a lot of the underlying data model is also uh, undergoing continuous discussion at a, another group. Also, well, many other groups actually, but notably the canonical debate labs. Uh, we're working with these people and uh, those are uh, regular meetings online. Okay, hey, here's one for Lynette regarding changed management, excuse me, regarding change management, is there a normalized vocabulary for things like delete, deprecate, and reasons why so that the machine can take that info and act upon it beyond your own organization? So that's a mixed answer to that. So there are um, there is an activity type vocabulary that the activity stream itself 2.0 specifies and I put a link to that in the chat. Uh, and that that defines the create and delete. And then there's a whole bunch of others that don't apply because a lot of this has to do with things you do on Facebook like liking and things like that. Um, so delete and create are the two that most uh, apply. Uh, and if you look at the document that I posted the link to um, earlier, that's for our examples, 
I, I give an example of deprecate. And what that really turns out to be is a couple of deletes and, uh, and uh, some creates and all of them in that document actually are a series of deletes and creates. That's all the only two activity types that we use. And of course the advantage by using standardized in, uh, approach, then it's easy for others to adopt. Um, it makes it easier for others to understand what you mean by certain activities. So, but I will say the use of graph as the object is different from the activity to the activity streams 2.0 specification that does not exist there. Um, so we're still reviewing what we have to see if we need to come closer to the actual specification. But as much as possible, we want to use specifications, you know, specs that are already defined because that definitely makes the space easier to work with. There ought to be tools to process it and things like that. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, Magnus did send in a clarification about the describing the quality of the source. Um, they mentioned just that linked data will make the access to information explode and we'll have conflicting statements. So one big step would be to start classifying sources, source quality and make it machine readable. So I guess, is that something you've explored at all, Sarah? I don't even know if it's really available much yet. I'm wondering if this is more a question for Lynette. It could be, yeah. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening very closely. Which <laughs> okay. it's, about, it's about the the quality of sources. So if you got, if you're doing anything to sort of signify when there's conflicting statements, if there's a if there's a source that's more authoritative or or higher quality, if there's an, if you're doing any work to signify that. I'm actually not following that. Um, I would. Yeah, I'm not sure how that applies to my presentation. Okay. Well, we can we can we can uh, think about it in the chat as well. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah, um, this person would love to hear more about the strengths assessment and how that was shared among your team. Did everyone learn each other's strengths, um, and did the results affect how projects were organized and staffed? So we already had a bit of a division of labor um, established in our in our group. Um, so two of us had received the the formal assessment, and then the other two um, kind of reviewed and kind of self identified um, in like certain areas. So my particular um, kind of presence or preferences are kind of on the ideation and um, clarification realm, which kind of suits my um, position as an analyst in our group, whereas um, other people who have more kind of implementation tendencies um, are more working in that space of developing prototypes and, and, and things like that. So we were kind of like naturally positioned, but it did kind of create this like a funny dynamic where it was like, oh, so-and-so is being such an implementer, la ha ha. Um, so it kind of gives us an opportunity to like be very explicit with each other about um, how we're, we're working together, which is, which is kind of nice. Anecdotally, um, when we received the assessment, the, the, the facilitator kind of suggested that academia is full of people who are ideators and implementers who are strong in those two fields. So any meeting that you have where someone's like, oh, I have a great idea, let's do it. That's that ideator implementer thing. I'm, I'm guessing that that is uh, rampant in academic environments of all kinds, but I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about. It has its limitations, um, but it's a useful framework. So I think we have time for like one more question very quickly. And then there, unfortunately there'll be some leftovers. So maybe we could take it to Slack, um, but let's see this one. Um, for Society Lib, the three topics you showed seem very contemporary. How did you decide on them? Um, I know you mentioned an analysis of the documents eventually creates the questions, but I'm wondering how you decided on those documents to ingest. 
Awesome. Thank you for your question. So from the outset of the project, we knew we had to limit our scope. So we decided to focus on English speaking US and we chose the frame of dealing with high impact, persistent and polarizing issues. So our flagship project was climate change because at the time, according to, according to survey data we had access to, it fit all of those criteria. But of course, as uh, COVID, um, the COVID pandemic began, we noticed that um, global output of news covering climate change only ever peaked about 10% according to the keywords that we were tracking. And in a matter of weeks, uh, COVID-19 was in 40% penetration of global coverage. And then um, the election integrity project is relevant to the US and it wasn't necessarily bound by resources much like the other projects were because it was performed by volunteers. So that one kind of had a little bit more wiggle room in terms of meeting our criteria because we weren't uh, expending much resources on it. Um, so that's how we kind of chose it. Although we do hope to break into more like philosophical subjects, even though most topics that we do cover eventually kind of like bottom out at like debates about physics and philosophy. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna take the last two questions that we didn't get to answer and put them in the Slack. So hopefully people can run over there and uh, get their answers there. So thank you guys so much. Clearly this was a very well enjoyed presentation with all the questions. So thank you so much and everybody enjoy your Friday. <laughs>